So I'm very honored uh, to be part of this organization uh, of the two-day conference uh, with the title Children and Youth, the Importance of Dedicated Spaces. Uh, right at the beginning, I would like to use this opportunity to uh, thank uh, all wonderful speakers, a total of 39 of you coming from 17 different countries and uh, uh, with the support from 25 uh, Creative Europe media desks around Europe. Clap, clap, clap. Uh, those are my wonderful colleagues who are supporting this event and without whom all this would not be possible. To uh, a wonderful team of Art Kino who is helping us um, uh, with the streaming Zoom and all the technical details, Bob, Andrea, Anna, Barbara, and Marta. Uh, and finally, to Kids Regio, uh, Anne Schulka, with whom we are partnering up. Uh, I mean, I would like to forward the thanks to Nicola Jones as well. Uh, I know she's with uh, her heart with us. And all of us are joining our forces for the common goal of strengthening children's films, uh, f uh, film education, and dedicating spaces for children. Uh, here we also have uh, the CEO of the Creation Audiovisual Film Center, who is also supporting this event, uh, the city of Rijeka, um, as the European capital of culture, and of course, uh, uh, under the umbrella of uh, German uh, presidency. Uh, before we continue, I would like uh, to ask my wonderful ladies, uh, Boba and Anne, to maybe uh, say a couple of welcoming words and say hello so that people also uh, get familiar with you and your uh, institutions and organizations. So, Boba, you have the floor. Uh, hello, everybody. Mm -hmm. I wish you a very, well, very uh, warm welcome uh, here in the Rijeka studio. Uh, and um, I'm really very, very happy that there are so many people all around Europe that are, um, how should I say, and that we are together in uh, trying to achieve so uh, important and, and humanistic goal uh, and to somehow foster education in the field of culture. That is a really important thing for me personally as well as uh, for Art Kino as an institution. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you all and I hope that we will have uh, an interesting and uh, uh, how should I say, uh, that uh, our two days are going to be uh, useful, but also uh, interest. Thank you very much once again, and uh, I will give a floor to Anne. Thank you very much, Baba, and I'm very, very happy to be here with all of you. Uh, I'm Anne Schulka, the project manager of Kids Regio, subgroup to Cine Regio. Charlotte will present both of our institutions later at the first panel. Yeah. And also a very warm welcome, like Martina said, from Nicola Jones, the head of the German Children's Media Foundation. She's at the moment sitting on a panel in Germany at the German Film Fair uh, to represent German children's film festivals and media education in Germany. So she's very much with us, although she's at a different place uh, than we are at the moment. I'm very much looking forward to this day. I'm very happy to see so many people of you here. And uh, I will welcome you later again for the second panel as moderator. So I'll now give back to Martina for the first panel. Yes, thank you. And uh, since we have also um, uh, Christopher Peter March is with us. Maybe Chris, you would like to say a warm welcome as well on your behalf. Yes, of course, Martina. So, so that we have this gender balance. Right? Yeah, yeah, you need a bit of gender balance. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, on behalf of the Croatian Audiovisual Center, I'd like to welcome everybody, all of the partners, um, to Rijeka and Zagreb virtually. Uh, both wonderful cities, um, and um, I wish everyone um, a very useful two days, um, even in the absence of person-to-person -person contact, which always makes make these events more productive. So, Martina, back to you. Okay. So, let's start with the first share screening. It is a two-day conference, as I mentioned, and uh, our focus is um, on the dedicated spaces, but highlighting the importance of uh, uh, children's films and uh, film education. So let's make this day great. Uh, 
Uh, I prepared the presentation as uh, I'm in school uh, and a teacher, uh, just so that it's not uh, dry and um, that it's more colorful because we are, after all, uh, devoting this conference for to children. So as I mentioned earlier, there are 39 speakers um, seven, from 17 countries and supported by 25 Creative Europe media desks. Uh, and uh, what is actually important to highlight? What are our objectives of the conference? Um, I must admit that uh, preparing for this conference, uh, it was um, quite challenging to gather all the data uh, because it's a, a bit dispersed and uh, uh, each uh, organization, each national fund, regional fund does in its own way the best uh, uh, it can. But uh, however, I'm missing some kind of uh, unique entry point so that uh, we really gather all information who does what. And I will definitely give my uh, also personal uh, recommendations by uh, moderating the panel. So our objectives are, and I would like to also invite everyone in the audience uh, to share, to exchange and to collaborate. Because without those three, we cannot move forward and uh, make some significant and important changes. Uh, main areas of focus are, have been already uh, discussed, uh, so we're going to especially focus in our second panel uh, on dedicated spaces for children, but the highlights will be definitely how to strengthen films for children and film education. This is how it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be uh, quite active, quite alive, quite colorful when it comes to the dedicated spaces for children. And believe it or not, there are not so many of them existing at the European level. So we're just going to uh, highlight those that are really um, having uh, uh, significant experience, like Watershed from Bristol, UK, Raisin Factory from Pigros, Greece. Uh, anticipating the opening of children's house in Rijeka, Croatia, and in a more metamorphorical sense, Kinodvor Ljubljana from Slovenia. When it comes for uh, when it comes to the uh, uh, children's films and uh, film education, uh, I used uh, three surveys existing at the European level. Uh, as you can see, uh, all of them are a bit. Um, let's put it this way, old. So we definitely need, um, with this year starting, something new. So uh, I use the data from European Audiovisual Observatory, uh, the institution which is quite uh, well organized and really uh, professional when it comes to providing the data and analysis. And they were working closely with Anna and Nicola and uh, Keys Regio and Cine Regio. Uh, in terms of identifying um, how many uh, children's films were produced per year and similar. Uh, but we need to be aware that uh, uh, they were including countries also uh, in the context uh, such as Turkey, Russia and similar. Then we had screen and literacy run by the British Film Institute and for the purpose of the European Commission and the latest one films in schools. So the support goes two ways. Um, it goes definitely at the EU level and it goes, uh, depends on a country at the national, regional and the city level. And those two somehow need to uh, collaborate because uh, one cannot exist without the other. So what uh, is good to highlight before we start um, with our first panel is that uh, from 2004 to 2013, there were 648 films produced at the EU level, out of which 388 were live action and 280 animation. As you can see, there are top five production countries uh, from Germany, France, Netherlands, Denmark, and Sweden. And to my surprise, uh, the top two countries in terms of the total admissions when it comes to children's films were Croatia with 29% and Norway 26%. So it's good to know that uh, in Croatia, we are really keen on 
watching films for children. Uh, of course, uh, uh, the countries uh, that are leading in terms of their national strategies and uh, devotion to children's films are definitely Denmark and Norway, uh, since one out of five Danish and Norwegian films is a children's film. And uh, what is important to highlight is uh, co-productions, so co-produced children's films travel and perform better than national films. Uh, thanks to the language, Germany uh, is leading in terms of the release of national films outside its territory. And this is something that we're going to uh, tackle uh, later on. Uh, the top 50 children's films, as you can see, are again leading from some kind of um, countries, big production capacity countries. Uh, I'm happy to see also that there is Finland on board and I put Russia completely on the right because those, this data is used from the European Audiovisual Observatory. But as you can see, we need more diversity when it comes to uh, circulation of uh, children's films. Uh, of course, that Creative Europe Media uh, is keen on supporting uh, production, development and production of children's films and circulation as well. Uh, but uh, uh, also something that I discussed with uh, our dear Maria Silvia Gatta, uh, it's very difficult to um, get the information from the complete uh, approved and selected projects because Unfortunately, uh, it's a bit difficult to um, uh, introduce um, which film is actually for children because there is no unification in terms of the age. So, for example, uh, Creative Europe Media will take uh, that a film for children is up to 16 uh, years, where uh, European Audiovisual Observatory goes up to 12. So this is also uh, something that uh, we need to consider. And for this reason, I, I highlighted film education call, um, something that was introduced in 2017 and which already um, gave uh, wonderful results, uh, out of which we're going to uh, discuss uh, uh, projects and partnerships uh, later on today and tomorrow especially. There was one study uh, led by the British Film uh, Institute. Uh, it's called Screening Literacy in 2012. And um, it was the starting point to actually uh, see what is out there and what the EU countries are doing. And more than 50 case studies were published. Um, and of course, there was the first notion and definition of what is actually a film education. So uh, uh, the level of understanding a film to be uh, able and uh, conscious and curious in the choice of films, to be competent to critically watch a film and to analyze its content, uh, cinematography and technical aspects. And finally, uh, there was Films in Schools 2015. Um, they kind of highlighted um, also uh, important challenges and definitely along the line gave certain uh, recommendations. What I would like to highlight is the point number three that 62 teachers described film-related teaching unusual and only 5% considered film education to be, to be well established and recognized as practice. So the school in Europe are not using films and audiovisual material to the full. And here we are with def definitely uh, uh, challenges that uh, teachers and film education and such uh, uh, is facing. So film literacy is not recognized as a subject. Licensing of films to be shown in schools is not a priority for the industry and uh, countries have different approaches when it comes to the copyright and licensing of films for children. And finally, there is a lot of legal, as I mentioned, uncertainty on the conditions in which films can be used in the context, in the context of teaching. So they came up uh, as a framework for film education. Um, where film literacy has three key, key dimensions, creative, critical, and cultural, and one 
needs to somehow be linked to the other. It cannot be analyzed as one. And uh, even though it was published in 2015, it was hoping to enable creation and strengthening bridges between the film industry and schools all around Europe. And uh, luckily, we joined joining forces from Denmark, uh, UK, Germany, and France. Um, they came up uh, to an uh, ambitious project which would uh, uh, be useful for the educational measures. And in June 2018, it was supported by the Creative Europe Media. There are definitely different uh, project goals. Uh, I've, I've, I'm, go I'm going to share with you uh, all this material and, uh, and the links uh, that were quite useful because it's not easy uh, to find the reference uh, for any type of research. And uh, there is a cute quote uh, I found from one um, pupil uh, while preparing for this panel and um, it says education is a passport to the future as for tomorrow belongs to the people who prepare for it today. So this was the first part of my introduction and how I envisaged, uh, how we envisaged the uh, day is uh, going to be run by two moderators, Anne and uh, myself. And uh, we are starting with the first panel uh, with the topic, how can we threaten films for children and film education at the European level? So um, you also could um, see it and check it in the brochure. The questions we're going to um, discuss today, the number one is what has been done so far, because believe it me, um, all those participants uh, in the audience and myself are sometimes, um, I'm sometimes lost in uh, overload of information and difficulties to find uh, what has been done in terms of uh, supporting and threatening films for children. Uh, second question uh, is going to be addressed to challenges. Um, are there any challenges at the moment? And if so, uh, can we name them? And finally, since we are uh, finalizing the Creative Europe program uh, for 2020, uh, can we do something in regard to the future? Uh, Creative Europe Media Program uh, coming up 21, 27, especially in terms of the films for children and film education. So uh, the first panel, uh, I will have six uh, gender, gender balanced speakers. Um, so I would like to welcome Maria Silvia Gatta from European Commission DigiConnect, Klaus Noer Hjort, uh, working uh, for the Danish Film Institute, but uh, today in, uh, with a different hat as a head of uh, EFAT Film Education Working Group. Christopher Peter Marcic, CEO of the Croatian Audiovisual Center. And finally, uh, we also have Charlotte uh, Applegreen, uh, General Secretary of Cine Regio, but also uh, representing uh, Kids Regio's initiative, Margaret Albers as the president of uh, ECFA, and Jürgen Biesinger, a producer of uh, European uh, Film Awards and uh, Young Audience Award. So, Let's start with um, Maria Silvia Gatta. Um, this is going to be um, the same for all of you, dear panelists, um, because you come and you represent different associations and institutions, but I would like uh, to have a first round of who is who and what do you do. So uh, if I read from the website, um, I'm now referring to Maria Silvia Gatta, that uh, uh, DG Connect conceives and implements the policies required to create a digital single market for more growth and jobs, where citizens, businesses, and public administrations can seamlessly and fairly access and provide digital goods, content, and services. Can you maybe put it in a more simple wording, um, what, what do you do at DigiConnect and why um, is it important to um, have uh, unique forces also at the European level? Maria? Thank you, Martina. 
<clears throat> it's, uh, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be virtually with all of you. And my congratulations for your presentation. It was very thorough and very clear. Um, I, I, I like your reading the DG Connect because you, you asked me immediately to make an association with the film culture and education. And, um, and it's a bit the challenge in a way, uh, a challenge that I think can only be positive to be placed in a, in a, in a DG that is trying to foster uh, the digital single market. Uh, the idea uh, is that, uh, uh, as you know, Creative Europe is split between two, uh, two strands. One is culture, which is, uh, at the, um, which is uh, designed uh, and uh, managed by the uh, Directorate for Education and Culture. And then we have the audiovisual part that is managed by uh, DigiConnect. Mm -hmm. The splitting uh, splits the part of culture and the part for the audiovisual sector. And the audiovisual sector is perceived as one of the uh, strategic sector for the digital internal market, as, uh, as pointed out also in uh, the last uh, council in uh, July. Uh, what we do is that we're trying to, um, to connect the film industry with the uh, digital uh, single market. And um, in a way, we're working both at the level of content and at the level of uh, dissemination and technology. And um, in this context, while this is a, a good thing because we're working for an industry and the media part program is part an industry program and not only a cultural program, it's good to be at the core of the priorities of the Commission because one of the priorities is to accompany the digital transition and we want to be there and to be part of it. On the other hand, uh, themes like film education are not always at the centre uh, because people do not perceive this as a central uh, line of the uh, of the uh, audiovisual policy of the European Commission. That's the part of media that uh, is at the Commission. Then, as you know, there's the other part that is implemented um, practically by the agency, uh, which is the education that implements all the cultural program. What am I doing specifically? I'm dealing with film education. I'm, uh, uh, I'm dealing with uh, film heritage. Uh, and uh, and uh, dealing with all sorts of horizontal issues. I've joined the unit in September after 10 years being away. And prior to these 10 years away, I have been working in the distribution sector. So I'm very familiar with all the efforts that has been put for distributing uh, children film through by our good distributors in Europe. Okay, thank, you. thank you very much. Uh, I would like now to move to Klaus. Um, EFAT uh, is a U European Film Agency Directors Association. Mm -hmm. It's working closely actually with uh, um, the CEOs of the film funds and film centers and agencies. And uh, in particular, it's some kind of echoing the voice of the industry and uh, working closely with the European Commission. And I was uh, nicely surprised that uh, uh, you are quite well organized and you have different uh, subgroups from EU policy and strategy, think tank, gender and film, ed and finally the film education. And we have you as the head of the working group. So maybe for, for our audience, uh, you can explain um, cle clearly or uh, in a nutshell, what does actually uh, film education work group uh, do? Okay, thank you very much. Can you all hear me? Yes. <laughs> Great. Uh, first of all, I have to say, uh, I'm sharing the head with the British Film Institute, Mark Reed, he's also here in, in this conference. But uh, now uh, I, I will say something about what we're doing in that group. But first, let me just, uh, say something about what I do in Denmark, mm -hmm. if it's okay. Yes, it's okay. <laughs> uh, in Denmark, we have a department it, uh, at the Danish Film Institute. It's called uh, Children and Youth Department. And it's dealing with film education, 
but also it's a secretariat for the Media Council for Children and Young People in Denmark. Mm -hmm. And in that respect, we have great opportunities to link the film education agenda with the media literacy agenda. Okay. Because uh, the Media Council is dealing with, uh, uh, with all perspectives regarding media literacy, such as um, bullying, uh, offensive uh, speech, uh, hate speech on the internet, uh, privacy issues, uh, disinformation, and so on. And what we think in Denmark is that, to some extent, not, not inform, the film education agenda and the media literacy agenda is very much linked. Yeah. The reason why I'm saying that, the key word for that is that we, we think that film is the mother of multimedia. Understanding film, understanding the visual context in film, the way we, we, we uh, the way young people can enter a film and understand the language of films, it's very much a key to understand what's going on in the digital environment because the traffic on the internet, 75% of all traffic on the internet is actually audiovisual. It's films, it's clips, and so on. So what we are doing in Denmark in that respect, for example, we are doing uh, um, we are doing um, an educational framework regarding what's happening on when young people are going on Instagram, on YouTube, and we use tools from the film education box in order to to explore what's happening on YouTube and Instagram. Mm -hmm. But children are entering that in that environment. So we are thinking to some extent there's a great link between those two areas of um, what's going on in the 21st century uh, regarding to film education and, and skills in, in the long term. If I, may okay. just, if I may just add, that's why um, the European Commission is moving forward in terms of the new program and uh, joining media, uh, media as media to the media sub program just to make it clear so we will have film and media yeah. uh, under the media sub program so yeah. uh, more work for us uh, but uh, maybe this is the reasoning as well behind because one is linked to the other as you mentioned yes but there might be even more more work to, to be done in that respect because actually a part of my department is not is, is linked to the media program with the framework project we are having in the framework of the uh, mm -hmm. EFAC group but another part of my department is connected to connecting your facility program regarding media literacy and disinformation. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we are very much uh, trying to say, why cannot we make a stronger coordination between the programs from the EU to make it more sustainable? But let me get back to that, okay? Yeah. Okay, I will talk now a little bit about the EFAT Working Group, um, which established a, in a, 2015 16 something and the reason why the EFAT wanted a group like that is that we need also to dig into the long-term distribution of films that was the first thing it was an industry thinking thing we need to dig into what is film for young people when we're not talking about commercial films in cinemas and or, or on television and streaming uh, services, but also what is the impact of film when we use film in schools, in kindergartens and so on? What is it for young people? This, is, this was the reason we need to have a policy on that. And then we have set up some keywords regarding to that. Why is it important to focus on education? And I'm just going down that, uh, down that, okay. um, down that line. First of all, film, we, we, we see film as just as important as the written word. It's important in the sense that it's the art and modality of the 21st century. It's the way young people understand the world around themselves. It's the way they build their identity. It's very much, we're not saying we should get rid of the written word of books and so on, but we're saying now film has come up and it should be Equal. Equally uh, dealt with in the schools like the written word. This is one thing. So we need a stronger policy when it comes to linking film into formal education. Mm -hmm. This is one thing. Another thing is that 
And it's a part of that. Film is the legacy of the 20th century. The way young people understand what happened in the last half of the last century, it's very much true film. News film, uh, historical films, and so on. It's the way, it's the way we understand the world, uh, the history of our world. So we are also putting that into the body, the legacy. So we need also to dig into the film heritage. Third, film is an open space for reflection. And what do we mean when we say that? Because that's, that's a buzzword. But what, what do we mean? Film can give the teacher the opportunity to take up themes that otherwise are very difficult to discuss with young people in the classroom. If you watch a film together in the classroom, you can enter uh, some themes, some very difficult themes to discuss. It could be anything that otherwise is very difficult to put on the table in the classroom. And it's important if we want to have raise uh, children in the 21st, in the complex world of the 21st century. And, and then the last thing is what I've just said already, film is the um, mother of multimedia. So we are, we are dealing with these very, very, you can say high level or very on, uh, philosophical themes in our working group. And what do we do in the working group? Mm -hmm. Right now, I just, I just touched on this. You can say one of the backbones in the, in the working group is the framework that was made in 2015, supported by the EU Commission. It's, it's called Framework for Film Education. And it was some kind of saying what is in and out, what is the definition of film education compared to other skills in the school. And it was made uh, uh, with experts like you in this conference, uh, and it was very, very good. And now we are focusing on how is the impact of this framework. And we have a project which is also supported by the EU Commission around Eastern Europe, and um, we have a MOOC, we have online uh, learning environment on this, and we are trying to finish that uh, in, the, in this autumn, uh, 2020, mm -hmm. on this project. And if, and the third thing we want to do about this project, and this is the keyword for the debate, I think, is to create how can we how can we make film education more sustainable? And I would stop here because I think this is, should be for the debate. How can we make it more sustainable in Europe between us and the network, but also between us and the more the, the much bigger educational sector in Europe? Sustainability should be the keyword for what we do in the European Commission and what we do here in uh, in this environment. So thank you for now. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's a good uh, um, uh, mix of the points uh, uh, to discuss because um, uh, there is definitely imbalance, uh, and uh, uh, we also need, as I mentioned earlier, uh, a point where we can find all the information. Uh, what have, has been done so far in terms of the studies, uh, in terms of, uh, of the countries as well, and the organizations. Because it's quite, everyone does it in its own best way, but it's quite dispersed. And, uh, and for someone who just uh, enters the Google, uh, the person is lost. You know, so this is just one recommendation because it will be good to have a com combined data uh, in terms of the sites, in terms of the projects done, framework, uh, and similar. But uh, we keep on, uh, um, uh, we, we continue later on. So next on my list, uh, thank you, uh, Klaus. Next on my list is uh, uh, Chris uh, from Croatian Audiovisual Film Center. Uh, and as I mentioned, I, I saw in some of the researches and studies that uh, Croatia was already uh, put uh, in the line that it's already implementing the national strategy and we both know that it's not the case. So uh, uh, even though the film center is uh, um, kind of new in comparison to some other film centers uh, formed in 2008 and it's somehow uh, backing up uh, development and uh, uh, production of um, 
creation films and and uh, co-productions but it's also uh, focusing uh, especially recently on uh, film education and um, there are a couple of um, uh, highlights uh, to mention here and I found them also in different studies so as the good case studies were definitely uh, singled out Art Kino from Rijeka uh, Croatian Audiovisual Center is supporting uh, under a special call for film related activities uh, among them film education uh, Croatian Film Association and the Seventh Continent program run by the Kids Meet Art. But um, I leave the floor to Chris. Maybe audio, audio, just a second. Ah, there you go. Now it's okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Martina. Thanks for the introduction and the summary of what we do or don't do. Um, we, uh, the Croatian Audiovisual Center is the umbrella organization that um, supports uh, film and audiovisual related activities across the board. Uh, we work on the basis of a, a, a program of priorities, one of which is indeed education. It's a multi-year program, um, but it covers all sorts of other areas. We are uh, of course, active in the IFAD working group, Uro Shivanovic represents us ably there uh, and does, uh, does coordinate all of the activities for, for the Croatian uh, Audiovisual Center. The, um, our financing includes financing of films for children. Um, and I would highlight here that in the last period, our, our last call for uh, proposals, half of them were for, we, we ended, that ended up getting approved are for children's films. So three out of six projects in our last call are for uh, feature length uh, films. Um, one is animated and uh, two are, are not. And we're very proud of that. And that didn't happen by accident. Um, we do finance, as, as Martina uh, said, a lot of uh, activities related to film, uh, to education, uh, in the sense that we finance entities, we provide funding to entities that organize workshops that are film education oriented. Um, and um, we, we work with our agency for electronic media on their activities related to film education. So we're, we're involved. I do agree that we have not uh, made enough progress in meeting our goals uh, in the area of film education, but we're working on it. And I think with, um, with the forthcoming uh, new national priorities, there will be greater emphasis on education. Um, and I think um, greater cross um, ministerial coordination that's needed to put in place a proper program because as we all know um, we can do we can do some of the work at the level of uh, the Croatian audiovisual center but to really be effective we need other ministries the ministry of uh, education, education to 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 weigh in to set this mm -hmm. as a priority uh, and to work with us through their own funding mechanisms to um, get schools involved with the uh, network of um, now digitalized um, independent cinemas mm -hmm. uh, to not just make film education a priority, um, but to see to it that it's implemented, that uh, schools get involved with the independent cinemas in putting together programs that uh, not only screen films, uh, but include the educational element that I think um, the network can provide. So we're, we're very much involved in all of that. We, as I said, are active in EFAD. Um, Urosh uh, is uh, very keen and active. Uh, so it's a priority for us. And uh, while we have fallen short of our goals, we're working on them. Yeah, and that's particularly for a small country, uh, I, I was amazed uh, um, those initiatives that I uh, mentioned uh, were just like a little drop <laughs> in the ocean, what every single city or institution, organization in particular does. But there are quite some more and, and uh, definitely there is a need to somehow threaten under one umbrella uh, the film education, because uh, this is what uh, it's definitely needed. 
Um, thank you. Yeah, and, and I think from the commission, and, and this is one of the areas that we work on through EFAD, um, we need, we really need a priority on film education uh, with the resources to back up the priority. Yeah, because uh, uh, also by uh, researching um, uh, and preparing for this panel, uh, I mean, it, it's um, quite kind of late timing to, to introduce film education at the European level as a specific goal, 2017. So uh, this is something that really needs to be continued. And uh, we really need uh, uh, additional financing because uh, I was amazed what I found out what exists at the European level. Uh, wonderful partnerships and uh, 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 all kinds of kind of uh, uh, co collaborations from big, medium and small countries. But uh, uh, in order to really uh, support this diversity, we definitely uh, need to make it as a priority. Yeah. Thank you. Um, may I move on or would you like to add something else? Oh, that's fine. I think I've taken For the beginning. Time. Okay. So we know who you are and what you do. So we move uh, to the regional organization, uh, institution that gathers regional funds. Uh, so I would like to invite uh, Charlotte Applegreen from uh, Cineregia and she will as well tackle uh, one of the subgroups kids uh, regia. Charlotte, can you hear us? Yeah, thank you very much, Matsina, and good morning to you all. My name is uh, Charlotte, and uh, I'm here on behalf of the Cineregio and Kids Regio. And uh, just before we start, I would just li like to uh, communicate a big thank you to the organizers, partners, and all the Creative Europe Media Desk for taking up this, uh, or these important topics, I would say. Um, you are on an important mission. So um, we will, of course, support whatever we can do in in, in, in terms of that. So Cinerecchio is a uh, very short European network of 50 regional film funds. Um, and together they allocate around 250 million a year to invest in film and audiovisual works. And of course, part of this funding is allocated towards films for children and young people. And just to give an example, so we know the framework we are talking within, every year at Berlin Film Festival, the majority of Europeans films selected for the Generation Competition Program has funding from one or more of the regional film funds. And often mm -hmm. there are more than, than one fund involved in, in the co-productions. So this year it was 10 films aimed at children and young people. Uh, let's see if I can get the next slide. Why is it not working? Here we go. So in terms of film education, I have to say that we do not consider ourselves experts at all. Uh, however, what we experience more and more is that uh, many of the bigger EU member states is that it's the community and regional level now getting the responsibility for film education and film clubs. So for instance, we have very nice examples and actions from here is Grand East region in France, uh, the region of Southern Sweden, Catalonia, Wales, Sardinia, etc. We won't have time to get into details, mm -hmm. but it's just to say it exists. Mm -hmm. um, and we can, of course, improve and we should do more. I agree. Uh, however, I also want to say that Cineregio and Cineregio family, we are only based in half of the EU member states. Mm -hmm. So if we want to do more and make a difference, we re need to reach out to other stakeholders. So a success story to Share is namely Kids Regio, as we mm -hmm. talked about before. In One the, of your subgroups, right? One of our yeah. working groups, yeah. subgroups, yeah. Mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it was actually started because um, that we wanted to foster more co-production and more funding for mm -hmm. uh, uh, films for children and young people. However, we realized that there was actually already a positive discrimination. So all the funds actually wanted to support whenever there was a very good project. So that was actually not the challenge there was a lot of other challenges. Um, so uh, the mission of Kids Regio is to act as a lobby network platform to push the agenda for high quality uh, and multifaceted European children's film. Uh, and in particular, uh, we decided that, that Kids Regio is focusing on live action feature films for children. Mm -hmm. We also have a subgroup for animation. Um, so the project manager, as you know, of Kids Regio is Anna. 
and mm -hmm. uh, what can I say? She's the true expert and the one who brings all the stakeholders together across Europe, connecting the dots and ensure progress. Uh, so thank you to Anna. Uh, and uh, I would also just like to highlight the importance, you were talking about this, about close collaborations. And there we have close collaboration with FCAT and uh, Margaret Albers, which we will hear from in a moment, and all the creative Euromediatists, which have been very supportive all for the conferences held so far. Uh, and we have to be clear, and uh, we have to reach out because it is not a big community in Europe who are dedicated to children's live action film. So we okay. really need to come together. So I can only support uh, what, what you, you were saying in the beginning. Um, let's may, may, may I just ask you one yeah. question? Um, since, um, how shall I say, not many countries are familiar with the existence of regional fund. Uh, now it came to my mind that in Croatia, besides Croatian Audiovisual Film Center, we also have small but still existing a uh, little fund in Rijeka as a local fund in Rijeka and uh, uh, back and forth we had also fund in Split. Uh, so if one of them wants to uh, approach uh, your organization, um, is there any kind of uh, required criteria to fulfill or it just uh, needs to be in terms of the existence and supporting local production? How the does key, it, mm -hmm. yeah, the, the key is that the organization are supporting uh, film production uh, because oh, okay. this is what brings us uh, together. Uh -huh. okay. uh, and the next step is then, if we look at, for instance, France, there's, uh, there are the regional funds and there are also funds at the city level and local level. Mm -hmm. So what we have said there is that to, to be a, a member, you need at least 1 million euro per year to support film production. But if it's a territory where we do not have members yet, yeah. uh, we are much more flexible because we need to reach out and we need to learn and we need to share. And, and uh, as you also know, I mean, there are wonderful co-productions also coming out of Croatia for, for, for children and young people. And uh, some of them have access funding both in, in Germany and Sweden uh, among some other regional funds. Um, and actually, when I talked about this, about the films uh, selected for the Berlinale mm -hmm. generation, uh, many of them have um, co-financing from different regional film funds. So this is also what we talk and discuss about. Yeah, there that, that was a quite recent and success story of uh, um, co-production between uh, Croatia and Norway and Luxembourg, which is the first time ever. My grandpa is an alien exactly. and uh, it was supported uh, on behalf of uh, Norway from, um, I think, Norwegian Film Institute, but also the regional uh, Lillehammer um, fund yeah. and, and the post-production studio. Correct. So this was so th there is definitely a way, even though we also in our heads think that it's impossible to collaborate with countries that are not in our common area of exactly. language, uh, territory, and similar. And yeah. this is also what we often realized that a, a film fund, regional fund in northern Italy, like uh, Friulia Venezia. Yeah. Have more in common with a film fund perhaps in Norway than they had with the Rome film fund yeah. in their own country because yeah, uh, of, of the situation. So, uh, yeah. Chris, it, well, no, uh -huh. just if I might add that that film, uh, My Grandfather is an Alien, um, has had more success outside of Croatia than in Croatia in distribution. And uh, we are, no, but I mean, it's, it's important, uh, it will be important for us to understand why, for example, in Norway, um, the the uh, reach of that film was greater than here. What contributed to that success in Norway and in other territories? And I think it's a good example of co-productions that can work uh, and did work. Yes, and we are not aliens to each other, as I did a panel <laughs> last year. <laughs> yeah. Um, sorry, Charlotte, we bumped in um, into a presentation, but uh, just wanted to, to get more clarification on the, some aspects uh, of Cineradio, so please uh, continue. So I just have two more slides to, just to get around it. So um, one of the questions uh, you ask us here today is how yeah. we can strengthen the children's film at the European yeah. level. So uh, Kids Radio and Cineradio, uh, we think, that Creative Europe needs a bigger budget than mm -hmm. what has currently been proposed by the European Commission and member states. 
So therefore, in collaboration with EFCA, we have initiated a lobby initiative to ask for a bigger Creative Euro budget and to stress the importance of supporting films and TV series for children and young people. Now, I have construction works going out on outside my window. So can you hear that or is it okay still? We, we can hear you. We, okay. we also hear the co <laughs> construction, but this is, this is a different reality now. So don't worry, don't worry. <laughs> okay, so just uh, to, for my uh, last slide, uh, another thing we think uh, which is needed at the EU level uh, is that we need uh, input and concrete ideas mm -hmm. about how to strengthen live action feature films for children. And specific, I talk about live action feature films now. Um, because as I said, we have another subgroup for animation and we think it's the live action where we really have to focus uh, um, at the moment. Uh, so we discussed, so what will it take if we want to get a point, to get to a point where watching children's film from various cultures become normality for young people? Um, and one thing here is, for instance, that last year Kids Radio in collaboration with partners gathered 80 representatives of participants from 24 countries for a two-day conference to come up with concrete actions. Uh, and the outcome includes a catalog and a study full of data and concrete ideas. Uh, and actually, I think, or we think that some of them could effectively be implemented in the new Creative Euro Media Program. So if just allow me just three examples mm -hmm. and then the rest of them you can read on the Kids Like You website. Um, yeah, Anna, Anna is sending as well to everyone. Uh, okay, the excellent. So, the book so she's and making it up. Yeah, so. Perfect. Yeah. Just mm -hmm. very briefly, mm -hmm. for instance, I love the idea about the project uh, 15 plus. Yeah. Because Anna. according to Eurostat, 15% of the population in the EU member states are under 15. And therefore, 15 Mm -hmm. percent of the funding for the content in cinemas, TV and platforms should go to this age group. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, the participant also said that 15 percent of the curriculum at film schools should be about children's film. Uh, because that is another issue, this about um, that is not, for many directors, it's not a career if you start doing children's film. Mm -hmm. um, so my question to you and to the panelists is, of course, would it be too aggressive to insist on 50, this 15% also for the new Creative Euro Media Program? So meaning that 15% of the media budget will go towards uh, children and young people. So this is a question. And then the other example, another idea, is this about, uh, which came up, the film screening writing programs that they should mm -hmm. implement that. Uh, so we can have quality scripts for children content because that is another lack. We, we need more quality scripts. And there we have a very good example in Germany, uh, which could uh, go European. And Margaret uh, okay. Albers can talk about that because she is the woman behind it. Um, and last but not least, and uh, this has been our kind of fight for many years now, we want to ensure that the media programs select a funding scheme distribution scheme each year will select one live action children's film so in the new program seven years it means seven titles yeah and i don't think that's a lot to ask but it will still be improvement from today so this is the one thing uh, i would like to end this presentation and i actually do have a little video uh, from uh, 90 seconds, mm -hmm. if you can see it. I don't know if it will crash or not be good, but let's see if it will work. Otherwise, I will stop it and then perhaps um, Anne will be supportive and sending the link. Okay. Uh -huh. Let's see. Let's see. Let, yeah. So it provides you with a flavor of the reading, recent Kids Radio conference. Yeah, I was there too. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, because it's already far on in 2009. And the idea was to have a permanent representative lobbying for children. So just uh, one word on the petition. Um, mm -hmm. If you have not signed, please do. It's, 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 it's again one of the lobby initiatives in order to have a, a, a bigger budget for the new Creative Euro Media Program. And of course, this is about the focus on, on, on films for children and young people. 
Yeah, th thank you, Charlotte. I mean, I totally uh, understand you and feel you, and this is something that uh, it's good. That's why it's good to have Maria Silvia Gatto with us, because uh, it's important to have someone who listens to us. Uh, and uh, uh, definitely, uh, th there is a slight uh, change in terms of the guidelines. Like all of a sudden, there was no uh, note on specifically supporting children. Uh, children's films and or films for children and uh, luckily uh, the, in the award criteria uh, it remained to support films for children up to uh, 16 years but maybe as we are already introducing something in terms of the gender balance 50 50 uh, we definitely uh, need to do something also for children in terms of the either 15 percent or to to uh, uh, to really highlight the importance to threaten, uh, first of all, development, and then within the distribution scheme, definitely uh, uh, there needs to be at least one movie per year because otherwise, anyway, the films for children... Live action. Yeah, live action, yeah. Because it's, I think yeah. animation is already okay. Yeah, and it travels quite well on yeah. TV and similar. Uh, but uh, uh, we definitely need to highlight uh, the funding when it comes to circulation because films for kids acquire additional synchronization, dubbing, subtitling and similar, and they really have difficulties to travel. Mm. So, but I don't think it's, I think it could be realistic with the one film per year because yeah. it's not a lot to ask. I think you will have a big lobby from others saying no, 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 if you ask for more. But this mm. is uh, just uh, the feedback we have from the industry. Yeah. Uh, Chris, you wanted to say no, something? Just, just to say that I'll be happy to look at the petition for Croatia, and I'm sure my colleagues in EFAD will as well. I, I have to see the, the details and talk to Martina more offline. Uh, but it's a, <laughs> it's a concept that appeals, and uh, I think it's, it's worthwhile. And, I guess, in a, in a way, I, I, my colleague Uros had sent me a copy of the Weimar Declaration, which is only a year old, and, uh, and uh, I think is something worth recalling. It does give support to, to this initiative. Uh, and I would add that my colleague Julie Jean just informs that uh, the petition itself was circulated to all of us uh, EFAD members, so we have an opportunity as a group to support the lobbying. Yeah. Perfect. But maybe it's a good timing now to move to Margaret. Um, Margaret, are you here? I think it's a good ter transition um, uh, to continue with very important organization existing uh, at the European level. Uh, are you here? Just yes, I am. Ah, oh, I okay. Am. Hello, hello. <laughs> so maybe uh, you you listen to, to the previous uh, conversations and uh, uh, definitely it's important to know more about uh, European Children's Film Association. So I give you the floor. Thanks a lot, Martina. And thanks for having me here. And uh, hello to everybody. There are more than 90 people in this conference, which is quite impressive. Lots of them are for members, but uh, lots are not yet, mm -hmm. maybe. Yeah. And um, before I start my very brief presentation, I would um, heavily, really heavily underline what Charlotte just said. I have to admit that I'm personally a big fan of the 15 plus idea, the 15% idea, because we're talking these days a lot about diversity, gender equality and in this mm -hmm. way we also have to talk about age equality because what age groups profit from these programs and we have to be very clear and have to take a look into the mirror each morning that it's not for us not only also for us but it cannot be that it's only something for 40 plus 30 plus 50 plus 60 plus so where are the children and where are the youth? So that is one of the crucial problems because these age groups uh, have no direct representation in the political circuit. So that is also one of the reasons why there is something like ECFA around. And uh, so ECFA has been around for quite a while, since 88. Uh, we have almost 150 members from more than 40 countries, um, mainly European, but uh, in the meantime, also 
festivals um, from outside Europe, like from Japan or um, Mexico, North America, joined ECFA because um, we have in common um, to um, support European children's films worldwide in different ways. Very briefly, so what, what are we doing? So because as I already said, while well, our vision is really focused on children, that they have access to a variety of uh, high quality films and different genres, different formats, everything for them as well, because they should have the same rights as we have in terms of um, publicly funded culture and media. And so what we're actually doing is pretty much associated to um, business information. So we spread relevant information among its members and beyond. Four times a year, we have our ECFA journal. And uh, in this journal, uh, you find all relevant information of what's going on in the children's film circuit. Um, and it's also available for non-members. So if you go to our website, um, you can subscribe to it and get it. There are four journals and uh, six mm -hmm. updates. And um, it has been said that the children's film community is small. Um, I think it's growing in a way and uh, it's very active and it's very keen on networking. And so that are also two fields like networking, facilitating, um, because very often uh, these organizations and projects are small and in terms of staff, they focus on their project they're just right now working on. But for, for a, the bigger view, there's not so much time. And so for us, it's very important to bring different people doing or uh, working in the same field and uh, working in projects which can learn from each other. Um, these are um, the things we are there for. And also lobbying, Charlotte already pointed it out that okay. it's Regio and ECFA are teaming up in lobby work, especially concerning uh, the Creative Europe program. And again, a big underlying what um, uh, Charlotte said concerning uh, the scheme that it should be possible to have at least one film a year, live action children's film. And maybe um, I stop this briefly and show you something else. Um, this is um, really our little treasure because it's always asking about data. Uh, yeah. This is the ECFA website. Mm -hmm. And on our websites, you find lots of information. And very important is our feature film database. Yes. Mm -hmm. And here in this database, you can see um, it's a uh, currently worked on and here are only the films of 2020 and we have more than 2,300 films in the database and there's also well on which festivals there have been wall sales addresses and um, if they are distributed in countries these data as well so um, it's always worth to take a look at the website and um, it's also good to mention, and I was really uh, nicely surprised. You you do offer a different um, didactic material uh, per film, which is quite useful to know for all those uh, teachers out there that they can really uh, take it as a guide uh, when introducing a film or working on a film. And this is something really valuable uh, to to check out. Yes, if possible, um, and or if available, study guides are also linked in, in mm -hmm. the database. And um, yes, yeah, so it's um, that's really in a nutshell what we do. Mm -hmm. And our experience really from the past years is uh, joining forces makes sense. And it's also a lot of fun. And uh, one of the Strength and strengths of uh, ECFA as an organization, it's a membership organization. So everybody who wants to join can join. Mm -hmm. It's quite easy. Um, it's heavily re relying on, um, um, how do you call it, on um, um, wait a second, volunteer work. So it's uh -huh. uh, rely <laughs> on, relying on volunteer work quite heavily. Um, but if you have um, a common goal, it works. So, and that's it. 
Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's important to to uh, get our audience acquainted with the, with your organization because lots of information is uh, quite useful out there. So thank you. And last but not the least, uh, we have Jurgen uh, from European Film Awards. Uh, today uh, uh, highlighting the Young Audience Award. Yes, Jürgen, are, are you with us? I'm here, yes. Hi, Martina. Ah, hello, hello. Shall we start with the trailer? Yes, maybe, or maybe first, uh, or maybe uh -huh. before showing this little clip, uh, just a little bit of background information on how it all began and, and, and uh, what it is about. Um, uh, the European, I'm representing here today, uh, the European Film Academy, actually, and uh, which was founded um, at the same time as ECFA, as I just realized, 1988, which is not completely right because in 1988, the first European Film Awards were celebrated in Berlin. And uh, as a direct result of this gathering of almost all recognized filmmakers, European filmmakers of that time at one place, they said, okay, that's, that's fantastic and we need to continue with this. And then they, then they formed, um, uh, the U and founded the European Film Academy and uh, kept on celebrating the European Film Awards from that uh, year on. And um, uh, and in 2012, um, we founded the uh, IFA Young Audience Award. Mm -hmm. We were approached so many times, for example, by Margaret Albers, <laughs> um, with the question um, or with, with the uh, appeal to to have also in category for, for the young audience, for children films. And uh, so we kept thinking about what, what would be the right formula to, to add a category for best European children film to the European Film Awards. And we thought it would be actually, um, it would be more fitting um, if, we, if we would make uh, an audience award out of this category to not let have the members of the European Film Academy decide upon the best youth films but but ask the youth films uh, the youth themselves mm -hmm. so we um, started in 2012 uh, in a small group and again margaret was was there from the beginning and consulting and uh, helping to to design this um, this category um, and we started with only six cities uh, in europe uh, Erfurt was one of them as head of the Children um, Media Film Foundation and, uh, and the Gold Sparrow, of course, which is our partner from the beginning. And, but it was also the Danish Film Institute, by the, for example, the Film Center Serbia and, and others. So in, in these six cities, we started to screen on one particular Sunday three films which we previously nominated uh, through a committee of film uh, children film experts um, they nominated three films which were uh, which are um, um, for an audience to in the first year it was 11, 11 to 13 and we uh, moved this in the later to 12 to 14 year old um, audiences and in these six cities we had now the uh, screenings of the three films in uh, theaters cinema theaters and um, and uh, between the film screenings, the, the young audiences started to debate, to talk, to exchange what they just have seen and what, what their emotions are and, and their opinions uh, upon the films. And after the third screening, they eventually voted then for their favorite film individually. So everybody was mm -hmm. like a jury was um, casting their vote. And uh, we put all the figures together and then a little bit like in the Eurovision Song Contest, then every participating city uh, then uh, transmitted the, the local result of that uh, vote to us uh, in Erfurt, which is the center of this uh, Young Audience Award, um, and uh, where all the invited directors of the films are there. and. Um, and at the end of a small ceremony, which is uh, streamed online in the evening of the same day, uh, the winner of, uh, of the IFA Young Audience Award then received the IFA statuette. Um, so that, that, that's, the, um, that's a formula of, of this um, Young Audience Award, which, uh, which we kept like this. And it, it just grew very rapidly from six cities in six countries to 
um, to over 30 countries uh, and I don't know, 70 cities or something who wanted to participate this year uh, before Corona hit. And now I would like to show you this little mm -hmm. clip just because it gives you, I hope, a little bit of uh, mm -hmm. the emotions and the um, uh, and the sincerity of, of the young people who uh, are um, participating in this uh, event. from Georgia. Hello to all of Europe from Sofia, Bulgaria. This is the Netherlands. Welcome! Stop the logo. Oh, no. <laughs> joke. <laughs> <laughs> joke, joke, joke. Uh, just, just a quick question. Um, this happens only once a year, right? Yes. Uh, were you thinking of uh, doing something uh, in the future? I mean, now we have these uh, challenging times and different circumstances, but to do something more often or on a regular basis uh, on behalf of the Young Audience Award? Because uh, yeah. maybe it's not enough. No, it definitely is not enough. And um, because at the end, what, what we are um, offering is, is just a very narrow window for, for example, mm -hmm. for children from 12 to 14. So it's, it's not for youngers because mm -hmm. we, uh, we need kids who are able to uh, watch the films with subtitles, three films one day with subtitles. So that's, that's the youngest, um, the threshold. So we could not go younger. And if we go older, then we would need to have a second category. And, but this would be off our um, limits resource wise, mm -hmm. uh, staff wise and money wise and everything. But, but you're right um, to have this as a one, one time per year event is feels not satisfying and we um uh and and the young audience world is it is developing further and uh, there was one step uh, for which we also got uh, three years in a row grants from, mm -hmm. from the creative europe program uh in the online promotion scheme and this is because what um, in the first years what we um what we got as a response was very often that the kids were asking where can i sh where can i see the films now because uh, i want to show that i want my family to watch it i want my yeah. friends to watch it i want my uh, school uh, mates to watch it and teachers and so and and very often we we only could be we said okay that's there is no second time because it's the film is not released in your country or not yet or will never be or uh, so we um, we aggregated uh, the film the the uh, the non-exclusive TVOD rights uh, with the help of a partner under the Milky Way uh, of all the nominated mm -hmm. film of all films which were nominated um, from the beginning 2012 and uh, to to get them on mm -hmm. on the um, uh, TVOD um, platforms so there so that they are out and that that they are accessible for those who are interested and um and but we only see this as a first step to to make them because the first thing is make them accessible so that's they're not uh that they do not venture again in the void of um, the european fragmented uh distribution market and um and the second step um would or the next logical step for us would be to um, to create um, to create something like a European uh, film club, something which mm -hmm. um, which keeps the um, uh, the contact, so we can keep contact with the with the youngsters who are participating in the Young Audience Award, and keep them uh, uh, informed about about films, but also keep and that's more important to keep them. Um, 
busy with this because what I think what one of the um, success uh, element of the Young Audience Award is that they are in the driver's seat at that day. They are they are the jury, and they are discussing and they are uh, deciding. and um, And we, for a couple of years now, we also uh, let the youngsters nominate the film. So there is only um, um, there is a list of films. Uh, put together by an expert uh, team, an, an adult expert team, but then the, the age group already is nominating the, the films for the Young Audience Award. So they are pretty much in a creator's position and, and I think this can be pushed uh, more forward and to, to let them decide upon which films, for example, in a film club could be watched and which films from the, from, from the different countries would represent maybe the country to be shown to the film clubs in the other countries, but there is there's one um, there is oh, there are some obstacles obviously, but there's um, one particular obstacle, and that's mm -hmm. that's the licensing scheme or the way how it's uh, how difficult it is to license um, films for for such an educational purpose. Um, and I, I, I would really like to address this, and I think that's the best possible um, um, place to, to, to speak about or, or to, to put it on the table as a question. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what, uh, what could we do to standardize a licensing scheme for um, educational rights, which would include also um, initiatives like, like film clubs, like um, things which might be outside of um, a school um, scheme and uh, because this is this is the most important thing because otherwise we would not be able to work on a transnational basis Cur curating films on a european level can only work if there is if there is a satisfying film licensing tool and yeah. the other thing I, and one thing please let me add is uh, um, what we learned especially out of these um, aggregating of the t mm -hmm. non-exclusive t word rights there is still a lot of um, between within the within the film industry, there is um, there is the, the film industry itself is not unified when it comes to how can we actually uh, what can we do what would what would be the best uh, thing to do for one particular film to make it um, uh, to make it accessible in across Europe on a transnational basis. There are the distributors and the sales agents and the producer and 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 they have. They are not speaking the same language. It seems for us, it's uh, we. It's such a tough work to make them uh, to aware. make them aware of this, and that we only try to help their films by by making them available. And it's and it doesn't cost anything for them, but still they're reluctant. Very often, not every not every um, uh, rights holder, of course, but still it's it it feels like uh, it's it's a work. Uh, against um, mills, windmills, and um, that's something we, uh, we see a lot of work. I totally feel you because uh, uh, I, uh, as a desk organized jointly with uh, Lithuanian, Latvian, Estonian, and Slovenian desk, an online event uh, celebrating the Day of Europe, and we wanted our films to be screened um, so uh, four or five films screened in a different countries to be available. Each sales agent has a different idea uh, in terms of the fees, uh, licensing uh, agreements. So it's a complete uh, mess, I must, uh, I must admit. And they don't understand that even older films, for older films, you need to be more open and not so strict and uh, asking really lots of money just to screen a film for a day or two. And yeah. especially when it comes to children, and we really need to uh, finally be aware that we are doing for uh, for them something uh, unique and for their better future, you know, and to really work on giving equal access uh, to all. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Oh, Chris, you something? Yeah, we, uh, we are just a bit running time. Um, uh, I will need to enter also the timing of Anne's panel because uh, after Chris, I would just like Maria Silvia Gatta because we have someone from the European Commission to give us an can I, can overview. Can I say something here? Um, uh -huh, okay. Okay, because <clears throat> I, I, as I said in my, my previous uh, presentation, I would like to get back to what we mean in the EFAT working group when we say sustainability. Okay. As I said, we have moved from creating a framework to 
for now to explore how can we create a, create a better impact for film education based on this framework. And now we want to enter into the dialogue with the commission and all of you in the film education mm -hmm. environment regarding sustainability. And one important aspect of sustainability is better licensing schemes. Mm -hmm. It's better models that access to films in schools, in kindergartens and so on, and, and in film clubs. And what EFAT would like to do is to enter a discussion with the commission and because of the corona and everything, we have been delayed and so on. But nevertheless, we would like very much to invite us ourselves to a dialogue with the commission. How can we create a better framework which is suitable for all of us? We cannot go in details with this, but we can create some kind of standardized, standard licensing schemes for film for education. It should be possible to do that because we have seen that in other areas of uh, cultural products and so on. And so I'm saying this to the commission that we would like to get back on this. Mm -hmm. Then an another part of sustainability, another element in that is how can we create stronger film educational programs, trans, uh, trans uh, border and so on, and also extract our different um, uh, experiences around uh, the different countries in Europe in order to create stronger programs. We need also to discuss this much more in depth than we, are, we have done until now. But I would like to stress is training. Training is a part, it's key to say sustainability. It's training for people like us in the film education sector, but it's also training for us together with teachers and pedagogues out there. So we need also to discuss with the commission, how can, and with all of you, how can we create stronger progress in this respect? Fourth, network. We have a lot of networks in Europe, and we have a lot of programs and a lot of different initiatives, but we need to create a better way of how can we have ongoing dialogue in our environment? How can we make better research to prove our uh, what we know about what the, the impact and the potential of film education is uh, exactly. How can we create research in order to say, how do, can we create a better connection between film education and media li literacy and so on. So there's a lot of things to dig into. And we need to have a dialogue with the commission in order to say, if we take all these elements together, how can we create a better media program for film education? The strand on the film education, and we will very much like to uh, to have this dialogue with the commission. And this was the, this is actually the key message from the EFAT working group and what we have been doing so far. And we we uh, because of the corona, we haven't had the chance to have every people together and discussing what we are thinking here. But I have now I have the opportunity to say it here, and thank you for that. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, maybe uh, it's a good time. Uh, to come uh, back to Maria Silvia Gatta, because we do have someone from the European Commission, uh, just to ensure us that uh, we are on the same uh, tracks. Thank you, Martina. Uh, I, was, uh, I was very brief because I think the projects and you speak much better for what has been, uh, has been done so far at European level. So I, um, uh, when I was saying that we are an industry program, uh, it was to f focus the fact that for us, film education is seen also as an instrument to uh, enlarge audience. It's an instrument for the uh, mm -hmm. current, for the audiovisual industry, because it's a way of renewing the audience children addressing children means addressing also their parents addressing children means also addressing a new public when they're going to be 20 or 30 that have uh, a specific uh, familiarity with the european filmic language um, and addressing children means also creating better citizens that uh, goes to the cinema and that continue to uh, to um, support the audiovisual industry. So for us, um, addressing film education as primarily because of the fact that the media is primarily an industry, a support to an industry, is creating the public and is making sure the, public, the audience outreach and uh, renewing of the audience. Uh, 
Uh, but it's also, indeed, uh, uh, especially because we're going to have the two, the, me the traditional media and the old media program, together it's creating also citizens that have a critical approach to the visual material that they receive in the various uh, channel of uh, communication and in the various media. So, what um, what we have been doing, as you know, in specific, is also supporting festivals, market access, and also ready training programs for specifically for uh, film education and for uh, children film. These things are going to be continued for sure with the within the specific film education approach but especially in the horizontal approach that we have towards other schemes of the media program in distribution in development in tv distribution in training in market in promotion and in festivals so our attention is completely there. Uh, one interesting, I, I've taken all your points very with a lot of interest and very seriously in the sense that I think that you, uh, you all touched really upon all the points in which we are ref on, uh, on which we are reflecting now uh, when designing the new program. Uh, one part that, uh, um, so the, the aspect that uh, we need to have, uh, we need to combine media literacy and media um, and, uh, film edu and, and education, uh, I think it's essential because again, it brings together these two aspects one is the cultural and European values and uh, support for democracy. And uh, the other one is uh, uh, the uh, education to the image. So I think this is going, this, the point Klaus was mentioning is going to be priority in our approach. Um, concerning the history, the film heritage and the combination with film education, we are very keen on this. I think that the new pro, uh, pro project that is launched today, as we speak with the um, Institut Francais, the European Film Factory, is exactly pointing at this uh, combination of making film heritage available and accessible and attracting for young uh, audiences with a package which is combined uh, which combines uh, pedagogical kits uh, in the educarte in the channel of arte uh, for education with the institut francais providing a catalog of uh, very very small catalog yet but with very uh, relevant uh, um, relevant uh, films, uh, usual Cats on Coup and La Strada, you know, films that are not immediately accessible for young uh, public, but make it uh, make it easy and for and especially make it easy for teachers in schools to use them as. Uh, as a pedagogical material, because one of you was saying that, uh, no, I think Martina, in your presentation, you were mentioning the fact that uh, um, school teachers are not often uh, uh, ready to to work with film as a as a as a matter of education, as a matter of transmission of culture, which is completely uh, outrageous in a way, because if a large part of our heritage is film and our children are watching films and they're not reading books. So if you talk about Hugo, you also need to talk about Truffaut. That's, uh, it's, it's a language, it's our values, it's our history. And if you want to have a, an up-to-date and critical way of looking at your world, you need to have a critical eye on the filmic production. So, um, Definitely, uh, this this project, the European Film Factory, I hope, is going to take uh, more ampleur uh, and more importance because we really uh, we really fo put a lot of effort, not only material effort, but also a lot of expectations on this European Film Factory that uh, is going to be launched today. Um, finally, I, I very much like this idea of uh, diversity and sustainability, and that brings me to the design of the new program in which, uh, um, in which the, we're 
very heavily working at the moment. Negotiations are not yet started again with the Parliament and the Council. We hope to have it, uh, uh, to have the restart of the negotiations soon in October. So I think that all the lobbying activities you're dealing are very timely. Uh, in the new program, as I told you, film education will be part of the audience cluster. And that's, uh, uh, that's secured together with other issues, indeed with film heritage, together with prizes and audience uh, outreach activities. Now, there are, uh, together with the audience, we're gonna have a business cluster and a, a content cluster. Of course, there, Two, uh, the questions you raised are going to, the question, the, the attention for film education and, and children um, is going to be maintained. Um, in addition, throughout all the clusters, we're going to lead to focus on uh, uh, horizontal priorities. And one of these horizontal pri priorities, uh, diversity and inclusiveness. And I very much like the idea, although I think 15% is a bit too optimistic, but I very much like the idea that if we, if we think about diversity, we need to think about uh, also diversity in age. And, it's, uh, and it goes into the direction mm -hmm. that European population is growing older, but also that uh, uh, children are get getting uh, a larger part of uh, uh, exposure to audiovisual in the audiovisual world. So I think it's it's an extra dimension that I will bring uh, with me at home, not because we're all at home, but in my mind with this idea of diversity in terms of age, uh, which I think is very interesting. On the question of licensing, which I think it's a, a concrete point and an essential point of our discussion, I think we need to, dis to really work together and I'm very happy to organize soon a discussion, uh, virtual discussion mm -hmm. uh, with, uh, with the AFAT Klaus on how to, to really try to work on a, on a standardizing of this, this kind of activities for educational purposes because it's the, it's the bulk where we always uh, um, Strang strangle. It's the, the core of the matter. Uh, I think that, uh, uh, but again, I think we would need some legal advice and something I'm not is I'm, I'm not a legal person, but I mean to understand that there are some exceptions in, uh, in uh, data. Uh, directive that we need to pursue and see how to better work with this uh, uh, with these uh, legislative tools that uh, we are uh, that we have put together. But this is again something that I'm I'm very happy to further discuss with you and with our legal legal advisor. We have been doing this for film heritage. It didn't bring much, but we hope to to move uh, further on this. And finally. Training, uh, as I told you, training has been uh, also part of our uh, activities for children with the Cine Kid and the Kids Key in our laboratory that we are supporting. I think that again, the European Film Factory also provides some sort of uh, training for the teachers because it's not only trainer for the audiovisual professionals, but it's also a uh, trainer for uh, training the teachers to be to get acquainted and to be more familiar with how to use uh, film packages for school S and ultimately to make every program we make we are proposing more sustainable i am closing here because i see martina is very keen on timing <laughs> yeah but it was really really interesting and uh, I, I let's let's continue our discussion uh, on this I, 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 yes i see some of the questions uh, um in the chat room um we really literally have like two minutes but uh i suggest maria if you can stay just a bit um, after this panel so that maybe you answer uh, some of the questions. Um, uh, one of them was... Martina, uh, I, I see that I skipped the question of uh, funding and the question of the petition, which is uh, totally but it, welcome. It, 
but uh, again, we're in the middle of the negotiations and I think that funding, unfortunately, is not yet... Uh, uh... Yeah, uh, I will just uh, like to uh, share with you some of the thoughts um, uh, from Pantelis, who is going to be on the second panel. So that's why I say that it's good that some of you stay as well, because there will be some questions that, that, that they like to see answers. But yes, uh, when it comes to the film education support, and you could see also from my uh, slide, um, beneficiaries would like to see uh, more diversity in terms of the existing initiative. Because for example, uh, I've really um, encouraged the projects such as European Film Factory, and they're going to be um, presenting um, tomorrow. But uh, you know, when people see uh, under Film Education, French Institute, a European Film Factory, 1 million euro, then they're a bit like, hmm, what's going on there? You know, So it, it's always good to open up uh, uh, a bit to this diversity. Uh, uh, now with 2020, uh, with the recent results, we, we managed to, 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 to get uh, the projects that are partnering up with lots of partners, but something like this, you know, when people see only one country, one project, uh, uh, it's, it beats, uh, it beats scares, scares him, scares them to even apply, um, because, uh, um, they also have great initiatives that they would like to uh, be visible and supported, which was the case in 2020. So this was one question. And the other question was from also for Greece regarding the creative documentaries. Uh, um, well, uh, I'm not sure um, where this was heading, but uh, uh, this is also under the support of the media sub program. And later on under Film Centralen, uh, uh, we can also discuss this a bit further to see how documentaries can help in education. Uh, we are mostly concentrated on live action, animation, shorts, uh, and features. But uh, last year, a um, uh, uh, dear colleague from uh, Portugal, Susana, organized this special focus and Ebola conference uh, um, in uh, October that is difficult to use documentaries as well in uh, education and that we need to foster them. It was difficult to find them, that we could use them uh, for uh, educational purposes, and this is something also to uh, reflect on. Uh, we are a bit over time. Uh, I thank you all, the panelists. I think each of you managed to have a say, and it was really um, uh, valuable to have you all from different uh, associations and uh, you, Maria Silvia Gatta, from the European Commission, to really hear at one place uh, uh, how everybody um, feels. But I encourage you to, um, to stay uh, for the next panel and maybe to allow people as well in the audience uh, to ask questions so that uh, we don't, uh, in a way, leave them um, without answers.